Thank you, Mark. This, as I'm sure you recognise, is the Merchant Adventurers Hall in York, pictured here in slightly sunnier conditions than it has experienced in the past week or so. The Merchant Adventurers Hall is a guild hall, built between 1359 and 1367 by the religious fraternity of our Lord Jesus Christ and the Blessed Virgin Mary, and the mystery of Mercers. It is a building that reminds us of the great differences, but also the similarities, between our world and that of the Middle Ages, a building which combined the functions of a hospital, a chapel, a business and a feasting hall, and one still maintained by the descendants of that guild today, the company of merchant adventurers. As a researcher, what we're often looking for are those gaps in scholarly understanding, which we can answer through our own research. Having fallen in love with the Merchant Adventurers Hall when I first came to York, I was astonished to discover that we knew very little about this type of public building. And I've therefore dedicated my academic career to addressing this gap in scholarship. But being an archaeologist means that I'm not just interested in researching, surveying, and dating these buildings, but also in helping those who own and manage these buildings today to tell their story. Now, initially, I set out to do this by applying for a very large grant from the Arts and Humanities Research Council. I was going to study all the guild halls in the UK, oh, the enthusiasm of youth. I didn't get the grant. But I did receive an email from the chairman of the panel, Professor Ronnie Mulrine, who happened to be the chairman of governors at another guild hall in Stratford-upon-Avon, occupied by the King Edward VI Grammar School. The school was looking for someone to help them understand the complex of guild buildings which they occupied in the heart of this celebrated historic town. Now, when you invite an archaeologist into your building, you run a few risks. This is the pedagogue's house and headmaster's office in King Edward VI Grammar School. I was confidently told that this was the earliest purpose-built timber-framed schoolhouse in the country and that this was well attested because of a surviving documentary record uh, referring to a donation, a bequest from its first schoolmaster in 1427. Unfortunately, our archaeological survey and tree-ring dating of the building revealed that it was built over a century later in 1502. This was not quite what the school had anticipated when it invited me to help them understand their buildings. But I'll come back to this building later in my talk. I was on much safer territory with the Guild Hall itself. Rebuilt by the Guild of the Holy Cross from 1417 onwards, I could use my knowledge of the York Halls to help the school understand how the library on the ground floor of this building had once been a chapel and parlours for the chaplains of the Holy Cross Guild, how its first floor had been used as a feasting and a business meeting hall by the Guild, and also how, through archaeological survey, we could understand, this is a cross-section of the building, the addition of the south wing of this building as a private, separate meeting space or counting and council house for the elite of the guild to meet in. But the story of Stratford's Guild Hall almost became more interesting as we moved into the 16th century. Like many religious fraternities, the Guild of the Holy Cross was suppressed at the Reformation in 1547. Initially, the hall and the Guild's assets were confiscated by the Crown, but gradually they were re renegotiated back by the very same men or their sons or nephews who had surprisingly emerged from the Reformation as the newly constituted corporation or town council of Stratford-upon-Avon. The hall was successfully adapted to meet the needs of this new civic body. And you see here the dais end of the old guild hall readapted to form the council meeting space of that corporation. And its civic regalia and functions that were newly created fiercely protected the reputation of the council, appropriating the ways in which the hall had been used in the Middle Ages. And you see a fantastic ordinance here threatening to fine any members of the corporation who discuss the secrets of the council outside the walls of the Guild Hall. But Stratford-upon-Avon's Guild Hall is also of international importance because this is Shakespeare's Guild Hall. 
Shakespeare's father, John, was a chamberlain of the corporation, and it is highly likely that Shakespeare himself was educated in the Guildhall's schoolroom. Indeed, this may well have been the space in which he watched as a young boy his first performances, as travelling companies of players, such as the Queen's Men, performed in the hall before the mayor and bailiff of the corporation for a licence to perform elsewhere in the town. And this is one of the wonderful things about working for the University of York. We can't resist in taking our research that little bit further. So this is an exciting collaboration with one of my PhD students, Dr. Ollie Jones, now a lecturer in the Department of Television, Film and Theatre, taking one of the Queen's Men's plays, The Troublesome Reign of King John, back into the space of the Guildhall, using our archaeological knowledge to reconstruct the original appearance of this hall and perform it to an audience of our colleagues from the Globe and the RSC um, to much national and international interest. Thankfully, we've also been able to redeem ourselves with the school itself. Ongoing research and collaboration in Stratford drew our attention to this will from 1502 by a merchant, Thomas Hannes, and a member of the guild. Hannes envisaged the rebuilding of a row of almshouses associated with the guild hall, complete with a hall and parlour, buildings which fitted the date and the archaeological evidence of the pedagogue's house beautifully. And further research led us to this rather unprepossessing building known as the Infill House, which forms part of the range of almshouses um, adjacent to the guild hall. In the 16th century, this building here is described as the former schoolhouse with the chamber over it. And thanks to funding from the university, we were able to tree ring date this building. And thankfully, the tree ring dating yielded a felling date of 1415. So we were able to rediscover the oldest purpose-built timber frame schoolhouse in the country. Phew. <laughs> The added value of collaboration with the university, again, is that we can't resist taking things further. Adjacent to the school is the original chapel of the Guild of the Holy Cross. This was rebuilt in the 15th century by the Guild member and former Lord Mayor of London, Hugh Clopton. Today, it is a rather unprepossessing building, mistakenly um, visited by many tourists, imagining that that's where they're going to find Shakespeare's grave, because it's opposite uh, New Place, Shakespeare's house. It's maintained today by a small charity who struggle to hold visitors in this space. But we knew that this building had a remarkable story to tell about a scheme of wall paintings created by Hugh Clopton and the Guild of the Holy Cross, featuring the story of the discovery of the true cross and a series of death-themed grisly images, including a doom painting, a dance of death, and a memento mori poem. We knew, rather like John and Tim's research, that records of the discovery of these paintings survived in antiquarian archives of the Shakespeare Birthplace Trust and the V&A in London. And this is an exquisite watercolour um, uh, then turned into a lithograph by Fisher, an antiquarian, in 1804, showing the discovery of the true cross by the Empress Helena, a theme that resonates with the York audience strongly and also in watercolours by the celebrated wall painting um, expert E.W. Tristram, held by the V&A. This is the gruesome image of the doom painting where the souls of the damned are being dragged down to the mouth of hell and the souls of the elect, the bishops rising from their graves, are making their way up into the heavenly Jerusalem. We also knew that there were some remarkable photographs of the discovery of the Dance of Death painting in the late 1950s by the wonderfully named Wilfred Pudafat. And you might just be able to make out here the leg of a demon and black letter inscription recorded by Pudafat in groundbreaking photographic uh, recording. So working again with our colleagues here um, to use these drawings as a basis for reconstruction, we've collaborated with the Centre for the Study of Christianity and Culture to create a groundbreaking three-dimensional digital model which is open access publication and which can be viewed by viewers and um, visitors to the chapel itself, putting back the records of those paintings into their original context and allowing visitors to move virtually around the space itself. So, from a failed bid for a research project, a 10-year partnership has been born 
that has brought Stratford-upon-Avon and York incredibly close together. The Guildhall has been a laboratory for all our smart ideas and technologies, has opened it up both literally and figuratively the world in which our greatest poet and playwright spent his formative years. And the impact of our research is that last year, the Heritage Lottery Fund awarded King Edward VI Grammar School £1.4 million to open up the building to the public and to use our research to tell the story of Shakespeare's school and his cultural world, a fitting tribute to mark the 400th anniversary of his death. Thank you very much. Thank you.